September, 70 CE. Josephus wanders through the charred ruins of Jerusalem, Titus following close behind. In the upper city, the battle is still raging. The temple will not be rebuilt. Titus invites Josephus to take whatever loot he wants from the city, but Josephus rescues only the scrolls of the Bible. Over the next several days, Josephus convinces Titus to grant clemency to his family and 50 of his old friends from the yeshiva. He even rescues three of his friends from the cross himself. After promising to return the land to those Jews who had stayed faithful to Rome, Titus offers to build Josephus a villa overlooking the city, but Josephus declines. The Roman legion will not be able to protect him from the wrath of his countrymen. He looks out at his city for what he knows will be the last time, and says, There is no one left. At the end of the battle, all of Jerusalem was demolished, except for the Praetorium and adjoining city wall on Mount Zion. This was to serve as the new permanent home of the 10th Fratensis. The 12th Fulminata was reassigned to the Caucasus as punishment for its defeat in the Battle of Beit Choron. Though, as you may recall, the 12th Fulminata was completely wiped out at Beit Choron, and the new 12th Fulminata comprised an entirely different set of soldiers. The local forces and foreign volunteers brought to assist in the siege returned to their homes. This left the 5th Macedonica and 15th Apollinaris to accompany Titus back to Rome. Over four years of war, the Romans had amassed 97,000 Jewish POWs, who now became slaves. Of these, almost all men over the age of 17 were shipped off to the provinces, mostly consigned to hard labor in Egypt or forced to fight to the death as gladiators or be ripped apart by wild beasts as entertainment for the provincial cities. Only 700 teenage boys judged to be the most handsome were brought back to Italy, where the Roman Senate granted both Titus and now Emperor Vespasian a triumph. A triumph was not just a celebratory parade. It was an intricate, heavily structured event that combined political propaganda with religious ritual. The triumph had once been a pretty common event in Rome, but over time it had decreased in both frequency and legitimacy. The previous triumph had taken place in 66, when Nero had falsely taken credit for the work of his generals in a war over Armenia that Rome didn't actually win. That triumph had been voided when Nero was deposed, making the Flavian triumph the first legitimate triumph that most Romans could remember. It was a rager. First, a succession of wagons carried massive billboard-sized paintings depicting the various battles of the war. Although Josephus doesn't specify, it's likely that one of the paintings was of him, making his prophecy to Vespasian before the ruined gates of Yodfat. The last two of these paintings showed the Jewish temple in flames, followed by the leveled remains of Jerusalem. After this came a series of wagons heaped with silver coins and looted valuables collected throughout the war. The last of these wagons, however, carried a special place for the spoils of the temple, the altar table, the trumpets of the Levite musicians, the menorah, and a Torah scroll. It is this final wagon that was later immortalized in the Arch of Titus, which is how we now know what the menorah looked like. Jewish law forbade walking under this arch until 1948. After this came the 700 POWs selected by Titus, led by a shackled Simon bar -Giora. Upon the triumph's conclusion at the Temple of Jupiter Optimus Maximus, bar -Giora and the 700 boys were ritually executed. For reasons lost to history, John of Giscala was exempted from this fate, and instead spent the rest of his life in the Mamertine prison. Then came the imperial family. In effect, this was not just a triumph, but the coronation of an entirely new dynasty of emperors. As a result, an additional third chariot was added for Vespasian's younger son, Domitian, who had spent the entire war back in Rome. As night fell, everyone returned to their homes for feasts and drunken revelry. Said Josephus of the festivities, all day long, the city of Rome celebrated the triumphant issue of the campaign against her enemies, the end of civil strife, and the beginning of hope for a joyful future. But this was a lie. Although the triumph had taken place a year after the fall of Jerusalem, the Jewish war was still ongoing, and would continue for over a year. To further commemorate and cement his glory, Vespasian demolished the hated pleasure palace of the late Emperor Nero 
and in its place built a massive amphitheater, paid for by the looted temple treasury and built by yet more Jewish POWs, specially imported from the provinces for maximum humiliation. That's right, the pyramids may not have been built by Jewish slaves, but the Colosseum was. In keeping with Roman superstition, Vespasian then ordered the execution of any Jewish men in Italy who claimed descent from King David, so as to prevent another messiah. This effort was almost certainly unsuccessful. Meanwhile, back in Judea, a rogue general named Judah Ben-Ari had taken over what remained of Bargiora's peasant army and was holding out on the far shore of the Dead Sea. Judea's new governor Lucilius Bassus had already driven Ben-Ari from the fortifications at the tomb of Herod, but now Bassus was faced with the prospect of assaulting the most impenetrable fortress in the province. A century earlier, King Herod had built the fortress at Machaerus in advance of his short-lived conquest of Nabatea. It was on a high precipice with sight lines to every other fortress in the region, surrounded by deep ravines. The Romans mounted their assault by filling in one of these ravines to form a land bridge, but this gave the Jews enough time to send out sorties to hold the legion beyond the walls. During a period of downtime, the Romans captured a teenage Jewish soldier named Eleazar, who had been loitering outside the wall, and held him hostage, compelling Ben-Ari to negotiate an end to the battle. It isn't clear why a single hostage brought Ben-Ari to the table, but Josephus theorizes that Ben-Ari had never intended to defeat the Romans in open battle. Rather, he convinced Bassus to let the 3,000 remaining defenders flee to the nearby forest of Jardis. But they found no escape there. Bassus had the entire forest leveled in order to hunt down every last escapee, including Ben-Ari and, we may assume, the hostage Elazar. With this, the last vestiges of the Jewish Republic were eradicated. Josephus euphemistically refers to this phase of the war as cleaning up operations, but it lasted more than two years, not least because Titus had declared victory prematurely and left just one legion to deal with the rest. The final battle was still to come, and it would be the source of legend. While Judah Ben-Ari's forces were the last of the Jewish army, they were not the last of the rebellion. At the very beginning of the war, the fortress of Masada had been occupied by a shadowy and murderous faction, known by the name of the daggers they carried, the Sicarii. If you've heard that name, it's probably in reference to drug cartels or Jewish supremacists, and that's not a coincidence. We don't have any surviving attestations of their governing philosophy, only Josephus' second-hand reports, and even he never explicitly calls them out as one of Judea's political factions. Reading between the lines, the Sicarii most likely began as one of the many gangs of bandits that preyed on the caravans coming up from Arabia before the war. They got their name from the Sika, a type of medium-length dagger which they used to murder their mostly Jewish victims, and had a reputation for indiscriminate bloodlust. Their apparent founder, Menachem ben Judah, had been the last surviving son of the zealot founder Judas of Gamala, and they seemed to identify politically with the zealots whenever it was convenient to deflect responsibility for their actions. Most of this is speculative, but it would go a long way toward explaining certain events in the war, such as Menachem being denounced and executed by his fellow zealots during the royalist temple siege, or Simon bar Giora being allowed to take refuge from the zealots at Masada. With Menachem dead, a new leader, Eliezer ben Yair, had transformed the Sicarii into basically a death cult, during the fall of Jerusalem, Eliezer led raids on nearby villages to take food and kidnap women and children into slavery. And on one occasion, he led the massacre of 700 fellow Jews at neighboring En Gedi. The Sicarii themselves probably never numbered more than a few dozen men. And by the time the 10th Fratensis reached Masada in late 72, they were far outnumbered by their captives. Bassus had become ill and died after Macarus. The legion was now led by Lucius Flavius Silva, no relation to the imperial family, who now brought the force of Rome to this lonely outpost. Silva did not go in hot. Masada was fully provisioned and impossible to assault from below. Instead, he encamped his forces on both sides of the mesa, constructed a wall of circumvallation, and began immense excavations to build a siege ramp to the peak of the fortress. For months, the Sicarii unleashed their arrows against the siege works, but they were too few in number to go out and meet the Romans. Realizing their fate, Eliezer ben Yair and his followers ordered all atop the mountain to be killed, and that the last among them commit suicide, proclaiming, Since we long ago resolved never to be servants to the Romans, 
nor to any other than to God himself, who alone is the true and just Lord of mankind. The time is now come that obliges us to make that resolution true in practice. We were the very first that revolted, and we are the last to fight against them. And I cannot but esteem it as a favor that God has granted us, that it is still in our power to die bravely and in a state of freedom. Thus it was that when the Romans reached the precipice in April 73, Masada was already silent. Only seven survivors were found, hiding in the storerooms, and it was they who later told Josephus what had happened that day. That is the famous story of Masada. But it is not the history. Over the past century, archaeological evidence has found no evidence of a mass suicide or mutual homicide on the mountaintop. A handful of bodies have been found, but they've since been identified as Roman soldiers, meaning there actually was some fighting on the mountain. The Romans pressed their advantage, broke through with minimal resistance, killed the meager rebels, and captured hundreds of women and children alive. So why is that the story? And to answer this question, we have to go back to Josephus. To many Jews at the time, Josephus was a traitor, a man who, when charged with leading the fight against the Jews' greatest enemy since Babylon, not only surrendered, but ingratiated himself to the imperial court. But here's the thing. Thanks to those archaeological studies, we now know that Josephus' account of the war is not only inaccurate, but inaccurate in a consistent and seemingly deliberate way. The story of Masada perhaps gives the biggest insight into Josephus' mind. Generally speaking, Judaism doesn't do martyrdom. The afterlife, if it exists at all, is unknown, and our foremost concern is the consequences of our actions in this world, both for ourselves and for the next generation. Jews do not envy the dead. We mourn them. This emphasis on self-preservation is still somewhat out of step with modern Western tradition, but it was wildly at odds with Roman society, in which even the act of suicide itself was venerated. When the Jewish war ended, it became common belief in the Roman world that Jews were simply barbarians, a primitive, disagreeable people with no great armies, monuments, or historical figures who could never contribute to Roman civilization. Josephus used his privileged status in the imperial court to give his people's way of life a voice, but it is one that closely reflects his own politics, classism, and general desire to express his disdain for Roman attitudes towards human life without offending the Romans themselves. One of the biggest challenges of historiography is that the most essential stories in a historical culture are often lost with time, because those cultures never needed to write them down. Most of what Josephus wrote in the Antiquities was already common knowledge to all educated Jews. The first 11 volumes are essentially a summary of the Bible. But because Josephus was writing for an entirely new audience, he left no stone unturned. Almost everything that I've covered in this series since the Maccabean Revolt has survived only because Josephus lived to write it down. The Roman Empire was an assimilatory power. Those who came under its control were expected to abandon their pre-existing cultures and become Roman in all areas of life. The Jewish people had lost their kingdom, their temple, their capital, and hundreds of thousands of lives. But thanks to Josephus' histories, they would live to fight another day. The Jewish war was over. The Jewish wars had just begun. Special thanks to my patrons, including Geonim level patrons Lev Cham and Vicky Nelson. If you like this and want to support the channel, you too can become a patron on Patreon, linked in the description below. You can also find links to my sources for this video in the description, as well as a link to my book, An Armada of Cats, Travels in Israel. Otherwise, you can always like, share, and subscribe. I will see you next time.